Hi, Alfred. Welcome to the podcast. No, thanks, Andy, for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, it's good to have you on now. I've been keeping a uh, really close eye on all of your stuff, particularly on Instagram and on YouTube. And I love your YouTube channel and the videos and the projects that you're doing uh, and everything you're doing in the property space. So I was really keen to get you on. And you're a busy man. It took us a while to kind of get this one together, didn't it? A lot of our listeners will no doubt know um, who you are. But for maybe some of them who don't, could you just introduce yourself, tell us who you are and, and what you do in property? Yeah, so I'm Alfred Jade. Um, I'm based in the West Midlands, country to be exact. Um, so I mainly focus on HMOs as a strategy, um, simply for the high cash flowing asset. Um, I didn't really, I think when starting out, I, I got very clear on what it is I wanted to get out of property. And for me, it was like building an asset base, which had a high cash, cash flowing. Um, and HMO was a strategy for me. So I, I narrowed down, focused on that, knocked away all the distractions, all the other strategies out there, because there's, there's loads, sourcing, buy to let, um, rent to rent, SA, HMOs, all that stuff. So I just fixated on BRRs, HMOs, and then try to understand very clearly how does it make, how does it work in, in Coventry? And literally network my ass off with people in the area to understand how the bills work, how to appraise them, um, building a team in those areas. Um, and now, yeah, I've, I've got a team in Coventry who deliver my projects. Um, and mainly, I think my HMOs are between anywhere between six beds to eight bed. HMOs, um, most of them I've gone through planning with, and now I'm kind of a bit of a tweak. Just again, I'm always kind of getting feedback from my agents what's working best, what's not working best. Um, so I think the rooms that get let with the quickest at the moment are studio rooms. So I'm trying to incorporate more of that within my portfolio now. And like the next three projects I've currently got in the pipeline, which I'm currently going through planning, are all um, studio rooms as opposed to HMO's big communal space. So it's a slight shift, um, but I feel like that's where the demand is at the moment. And I'm not about just putting property in the market. It's about putting assets on the market that produce income. Because at the end of the day, if there's no income, I'm paying the mortgages. <laughs> and I don't want to pay the mortgages. I want, I, want, I want the income to pay the mortgages so, and obviously benefit from the cash flow that it produces as well. So I, I'm about having a sustainable business um, to keep, keep yeah create a good foundation to allow them to then go and do bigger things in the property space, like larger developments. Um, so that's where I'm currently at with it. Yeah. And it was really interesting, just kind of before we hit we record, we had a bit of a catch up and you told me a little bit about your strategy and you said, you know, when, when it comes to the HMOs, I'm super focused, you know, it's just Coventry. And with the development stuff, I'm happier to look elsewhere in the country. And I think that that's so important. And it's one of the things that I don't know whether you hear it, you know, Alfie as well, but I hear a lot of people talking about different areas and looking at different areas sometimes because they can't quite find the deals or, or, or mold it around what they need. But I often think it just, you just need to be persistent and consistent, keep doing what you're doing, build the network, build the contacts and um, just gradually kind of worm your way into the market and the deals are there. And, and I think Coventry is an interesting example. I know a few people who invest in Coventry and I know a few people that have considered investing in Coventry and thought that it wasn't quite right and I don't know whether you've heard this but people often talk about Coventry being oversupplied now I'm not a massive believer in the concept of oversupply I just think you haven't got your product right either the location is not right or your product's not right but I'm interested Alfie to kind of hear on your opinions of that and, and in Coventry and obviously it works for you so how are you making it work I'll put it simply to one thing marketing Best known wins. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> seriously, best known wins. Um, and the reason why I say that as well, yes, there is a supply, a huge supply of HMOs um, in Coventry. I'm not going to lie about that. Um, but it, at the end of the day, it comes down to who's your, uh, your management agent and how good are they at marketing property and getting it in front of the people who are looking for rooms. Because whoever gets, whoever, like I said, best known wins. So if, if they're seeing your product more, then they're the first, you're the first point of call before they look at the other ones. Um, and as well, I think my product like stands apart from the other ones that are on the market as well. Most people that come into our property are wild. And that's the kind of fact I want people coming in, seeing the property, saying, I don't, I don't want to lose the property. <laughs> I want to pay deposit now and not lose the opportunity <laughs> to be in this house, basically. And, yeah. and that's the game plan. And so I do spend a bit more than I should, to be honest. If, 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 but for me, it's about, like I said, it's not about having a property on the market is about having a property that produces income. So if, if having an extra TV in the room or going over a, a, a certain finish to get people wild, 
and want to stay in the property, then that's what it takes to compete in the market. Then that's what I'm going to, I'm going to put out there, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it absolutely does. And actually, I was going to ask you straight away, what do you do then? You said you often do a little bit more than you should. Um, and I was going to ask you what you do. So things like TVs. I mean, the case that we're going to talk about today, it's phenomenal. And you spent 120000 on this project. So for yeah. me, that's a big that's a big project, a big refurb. And I actually like to get in and get out a little bit quicker. And most of our stuff is in the student market. And to be fair, we don't have to be as competitive in the student market to make it work because there's such a strong supply of, of tenants there or such a strong demand for tenants there. And so we don't have to do the ensuite thing. Um, we don't have to do the, the, the absolute platinum spec, although we've got some that are like that. But uh, in the professional market, we find we have to do a bit more of that. But what else are you doing in terms of specs that's really giving you the edge, Alfie? What are you finding that's, that's working at the minute for you? Yeah, I want to quickly touch on the, the refurb element. So another reason why I, I, my refurbs are huge is because, so for me, every asset I acquire is something I want to hold very long term. So long term, I don't know, 30 plus, it's basically forever. Um, so getting hold of a house where it's, it's fairly, all, all these houses are Victorian houses, so they're old. Um, we go back to brick, pretty much restart from start to finish. So new, new, uh, new pipes, new wiring, everything's brand new in the property, basically. So... I know, like moving forward, I know what's been installed in that property. I know who's installed it. Um, so any maintenance or the shooting really is very minimal, even if it's year one. The people that I installed it are going to come back and rectify any issues. Um, so long term, I think it, it just pays dividends and not have to kind of have the odd um, one person come in here, they're, they're in there to come fix this issue. Then the next week, next month, another issue. So just having everything brand new. So I, I don't mind spending the huge money as long as I can recoup back from the refinance, which is in my case, I'm able to majority of the funds um, recoup it. Um, and then kind of coming back to a question around um, what's my edge. So it's, 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 it's the quality. So I think one is, is the quality of finish. So in terms of the design element of the rooms um, is one. So we, we like to make it look appealing to, to the eye one. And then two, in terms of like, the way my room sizes are as well. So I've, I've been to, so this at the beginning, I went to a lot of properties and I, I just pretended to be, uh, in some cases, pretended to be a tenant and in some cases actually went to your investors project. And there were certain room sizes that for me, I'm like, there's no way I'm putting, having a single of that in my, in my portfolio. Um, this is just, this, this is the car, car crash way it's happened basically. Um, so I'm about having big size rooms. So all my rooms are 10 meters squared minimum, um, excluding the suite. So I'm about giving space. So most people don't want to come in the comments. I've got rooms are big, high ceilings. Um, so they appreciate the space within the rooms. Um, and I think that's, that's one, one massive selling point. Um, and then again, when you get into the communal space, it, it's, it's quite homely. It's like you, you'd feel like you're in your own home. Uh, the design, the, 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 the finish, the way things look. Um, and it, it just feels comfortable. So I think the, these are like little selling points, the TV, um, added in, I've got boosters on every single floor, so Wi-Fi is not a problem on any floor you're in, because again, these are huge properties, over three, four floors sometimes even, so it's just literally a Wi-Fi booster, um, so no signals are lost on a, in each floor. So all these little, little bits, which I'm adding extra money into, but I think long-term pays dividends and has a better tenant experience, and therefore they want to stay. Alfie, are you sure you're not developing hotels? Because these sound like hotels, they're, they're amazing. <laughs> Yeah, so for me, it's just all long term, long term vision. I'm not, I'm not making a product for today. Yeah. Um, like I said, so I'm holding these long term. So very, very minimal changes I want to make. It, 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 I mean, if I, if I, I'm probably going to update them every 10 years. Um, or I don't know, five to 10, I don't know where, where the market's going to be. But the more I can kind of future protect, obviously, the less money comes out of my pocket as well. Um, if I update these properties, because I think the market is moving. Um, I already see a shift in the commentary space anyways. I see a shift of people wanting to have studio rooms as opposed to a double suite room. Obviously, some markets, some countries, are, some countries, some parts of the countries are still kind of moving from a um, a, a room without an ensuite to, to desiring more ensuite rooms, and then the shift next after that is studio rooms where it's all self-contained um, within the room. Yeah, I think that it's that it's future proofing, isn't it? What you're doing, you're building a future proof product, and I, I don't know where we can go beyond this, Alfie. Like your stuff is so high spec, and it's and it's studio room. Other than putting less rooms in a space and making them bigger and bigger and bigger. But then you impact the economics. I think it sounds to me like 
you've really taken the product in the residential market as far as it can possibly go. I mean, unless we start putting gold gold carpets down and things like that. I mean, <laughs> these, these, these are amazing, amazing products. And it's, it's really interesting to hear you talk about making it work in a market like Coventry as well. Because it, you know, I, I do hear a lot of people talking about um, the model not working in certain areas and um, and I've, I'm always adamant that it, it, it it's the product. You know, there's there's always a space for the product. You've got to thoroughly understand it and um, and you've got to get it out there and you've got to put it in front of people. Another thing is I'm big on... I don't want anything without, which is not in the CV1 postcode, the city centre location. I don't, I don't look, CV2, all the other postcodes are yeah. irrelevant to me. So, Because another rule I have is, I feel like the most desirable um, properties in any city town is, is the, the bit closer to the city centre, basically. So the more closer it is to the city centre, the more options you have. Like, all these properties I have, I can turn them to SAs if I want to. I can, I can do uh, corporate lets, because, mm -hmm. again, a lot of construction going on within Coventry. So I don't have that just, and even what's called social housing. These are all options I can kind of dive, like if the market for whatever reason goes left, I can, I can pivot to any of these if I wanted to. So this is why I'm big on, on, on acquiring properties in these, in these key areas. I think that's great advice. It's kind of having your, 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 your back covered, isn't it? And there might be something down the road, five years, 10 years, 20 years, who knows what it might be um, that forces us to look differently at our businesses. And uh, interestingly, I have I take the same approach in the city centres, you know, very close to the campus. Um, really stick to a couple of core postcodes, and I also like to buy properties that I know I could easily revert back to the residential market. That's always my kind of backstop. I could sell this property to a family because it's still in the sort of area. It's still the type of property. It's still got um, a parking. It's still got gardening and a, a garden, and that's the sort of property that gives me comfort as well in the portfolio and i think um i've definitely sacrificed with some properties the ability to really expand on commercial valuation i want to talk to you about that today um but i've always had lots of confidence on the bricks and mortar because i know that yeah we could just sell them tomorrow to a, to a family let's talk about um your investment criteria then Alfie. this is a big refurb that we're going to talk about today One hundred twenty thousand in this project so when you're looking at your deals, where are you getting that sort of confidence from? Who's taught you? Have you taught yourself? Is somebody telling you that this is what the property is going to be worth? Because I've been there myself and I know that it can be a bit of a guessing game to some extent. And we know we've had a spate of down valuations, particularly in the last 12 months. And with the project that you bought here and the amount that you spent on it, you're talking a huge sum of money that was in this and a big part of your strategy is being able to recycle capital. So where do you get that sort of confidence and what are you actually looking for in your deals in terms of investment criteria? Yeah, so it's it's very clear in the sense, the way I, it's all about game plan and it's about, it's about network as well. So I'll explain in a second. But basically, so every deal that I look at, first of all, my, my first, my, my biggest risk is going through planning because I'm trying to get, I'm trying to, one, I want to appreciate past six bedrooms so seven occupants or eight occupants whatever uh, number of occupants is so once i've got the plan in for me it's like game time because at that point i can approach a lender i know what rents i can achieve but it's, it's finding a value or the, the game the game plan is finding a value that appreciates um the value in terms of how you want to value the property so if it's commercial commercially is there a valuer who who works out in that in that sense for that lender so what I do is I have the same lend the same lender, the same valuer who comes in at the start, who appraises the deal, what it's worth today, what's the refurb, uh, what it's worth at the end. And I find another lender on the back end on the long term product, so on the mortgage, on a commercial mortgage, who has this, this lender on the panel. And then he's the same person that comes and marks his own homework. So in my case, it's like I'm all I have to do is build it out. There's no oh the number is different unless it's some market change and it's drastic and you yeah, to justify it within the report. Um, because again, he's the same guy who's submitted a report six months ago, who's coming back to come and mark his own homework. So if he's changing this, and then he just I was just literally who he, he would lose credibility. So it has to be something drastic for him to change his numbers. In, in my case, he either come bang on or even above um, what he'd or he or she had, had written in the beginning. Yeah, you're running a pretty tight ship on, on, on all of this, Alfie. What if in the future that 
lender changed or that surveyor wasn't available. Do you have any concerns about, you know, this is always one of my concerns about commercial valuations. Um, what if somebody changes their mind in the future or what if the occupancy dropped or maybe not even that? What if somebody just, or the same, the same surveyor or valuer isn't there? Do you think there's ever a risk to those commercial valuations in, in the future? You know, I, I honestly don't know the answer to this. I know people who have been stung by commercial valuations, but I think they fundamentally had the, the product wrong, the, the actual property. Um, commercially valuing you know, four-bed HMOs in, in places like Doncaster where it, it's very limited. But what do you think? Do you have an opinion on this? I think, it, yes, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a potential with the value that came out might not be working in six months' time. That, that can, that can, that's possible. Um, and to be fair, it's, it's not even just about the valuation company that's coming out, it's, it's the person. Because you've had two valuers in the, in the same company yeah. value very differently. Um, so it, it, that game plan, it has to kind of, mm -hmm. in, in, in essence, you're, you're banking on, because I always say a value, you're literally paying for an opinion. Um, so again, another trick. So I know if you look at the costs of valuations, so you know when you get the uh, the, the list of options, that there's usually three or four mm. valuers you can pick from, and usually I know most of my ones are the, probably the most expensive ones on the list or the like mid mid range on the list, and I'm not necessarily picking the the, the cheapest. I'm picking the person who's going to give the best number possible, and, and so it's not just about mm. the, the cost of, of of the valuation, but yes, there's a risk. Yeah, the person who did the company came out initially might not be available or might not be working there for whatever reason. And then it's like, you're, you're screwed. But to be fair, I've got like two valuers I use who work or value the property in the same way as to what I would expect. And I'm, I'm used to the way they value their properties. And again, this has come from my network and then leveraging my network and seeing people from their experiences who are the good valuers or the bad valuers within these companies as well. Um, so network is massive. And, and to be fair, it's, it's got me to where I am um, by just speaking to people and learning from their experiences. So I don't make the same mistakes or or make this make the same thing that they did, they did basically. Yeah, I guess we can't remove all of the risk from everything we do, can we? And what you're you doing is you're you're controlling that risk as much as you can by knowing who who's coming to value it. And it's interesting to hear that because I haven't heard many people talk about that part of the process in as much detail as you have and it's obviously a real focus of you to make sure that the right person comes looks at the right thing and gives you the right result rather than just kind of hoping and willing that what you put on the paper at the beginning kind of just falls out the back end yeah not with the level of money i'm spending like as you can see the purchase prices are like average i think 300k is what i'm spending to acquire property and and then average i'm spending about 100 120 um, on, on my refurbs so I, I need to know and again I'm, I'm borrowing funds so how am I I can't go and be so confident in the deal without having that factual stuff written on paper mm. um, so like I said for me there's the risk the risk money is me getting planning once I get planning I'm going to lenders valuation report comes in if the valuation report does not support my end vision I'm not doing the deal I can pull out I'd rather lose five ten grand at that at that point in time than go and risk um, doing a deal and all the money's left in. I've got like a hundred odd grand left in the deal. Like just that money's not getting recouped unless I sell it on maybe. And another trick of mine as well. So every deal that I do, because I'm borrowing investor funds, absolute, absolute, absolute worst case. If I was to add the purchase price, add the refurb money and, and do it as a quick sell, could I recoup that money back? And the answer is yes as well. Then for me, it's like, mm -hmm. there's no risk. Because if, if something if something went wrong, so for whatever reason, in the case where I don't hit the value and it's drastic and I can't get a valuation that stacks, um, then my last result is to sell the asset. All I've lost is time. Because I know even at 80%, um, like, so basically if I add the number up and it came to 75, 80% of the deal, I can sell that as a quick fire sell and that will go off very quickly. And no, you know, no risk to my investors or the money spent. And, and that's, I've got 20% margin, basically, if that, if that makes yeah. sense. I think that's good good advice again. And I, I think, um, I'm not sure who coined it or who said it, but rule number one of investing is don't lose money. Um, yeah, Warren Buffett. Rule number two is don't yeah. forget rule number one. <laughs> is it Warren Buffett? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm a big believer in it. I actually apply the same sort of um, a principle to the stuff that I work at, and particularly the developments as well. Um, okay, I've got a question I'm dying to ask you. You've kind of... Um, become a bit of a, a YouTube superstar. Uh, I watch your stuff and I love it. And um, I'm really interested to know 
the methodology behind it what's gone into it why have you done it and I think I know the answer to this but I want to hear you talk about and tell us about you know what YouTube and developing your personal brand has allowed you to do in property and I think if you look at them side by side YouTube and media and property are two completely totally separate and different things and you know I do the podcast and similar stuff and you know my mom just doesn't really understand why I do podcasts and videos and things like that when my business is property but I'm really interested to hear from you you know what's happened and, and what's driven all the personal brand and YouTube and, and, and how you've been able to harness the benefits of it. I think I want to put one word against it, opportunity. Um, so I say opportunity in a sense, by going on social media platforms, it's the only way to really reach anybody across the world. So YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, you can pretty much connect with anybody. Um, and, and, and that's why I'm, I'm heavy on, on social media. If you want to create a wider, wider audience, a wider net, mm -hmm. you have to be on this pla on these platforms. And just to kind of put into context, COVID, we had lockdown. I have raised money from people that I've even returned the funds to and still have not met to this day. Um, and if, if it wasn't because, again, we lost contact, face-to-face -face contacts, so I couldn't meet people in person to kind of have a conversation with them. It was all via Zoom. Um, hello sign, hello sign. I think it's hello sign. The, the e, e, e doc uh, platform where you can sign, do loan agreements on there. All of that done through 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 the internet. And again, it's because they've seen me vocally in terms of what I'm doing, uh, the good and bad of property development, and they've just they've just seen my progress. And some people like literally just just seen my work ethic and they're happy with it and they've gone a call with me, willing to lend funds to me. And for me, without social media. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have done the deals I've done, <laughs> to put it simple. Um, I have had people just, yeah, bail me out last minute through Instagram. And obviously YouTube as well yeah. is now bringing in people as well uh, who are wanting to work with me. Like I get loads of people like, oh, let's JVR for it, let's JVR for it. And, and I kind of, I kind of knock back, I knock it back a bit because I'm like, so I'm very clear on my vision of what, what is I want out of life. And for me, this HMO stuff I'm doing at the moment is kind of a foundation for me in terms of, building a set income, a uh, foundation of assets where I have sole control um, because I know I'm going to go on to take bigger risk and, and do bigger things. Um, and you can't survive and do the bigger stuff because it takes longer to fruition without income. It's cash flow is king, in my opinion. Like you need cash flow to have a sustainable business to do anything you want or anything at a big scale. So I can't have JV partners involved in this. If for whatever reason, for example, something goes wrong, I need to sell my assets to recoup capital, I can't now, I'm not now come to speak to someone over here for me to sell this and no, no, I want to keep the asset and have a debate about this. So I want sole control of this as a foundation to allow me to then go on and take bigger, big, big, yeah, big, bigger, bigger risk and, and try and build more basically. Yeah, I think you're probably the first person that I've spoken to that has said that with as much conviction as they have. I obviously talk to a lot of people who use private debt and work with investors but very few have um, a clear differentiation between why they want to work with debt and why they want to work with equity or, J or JVs. And you very much have a sign on your door that says, this is what we do, this is who we're, we're, we're able to work with. And unfortunately, we can't work with these guys, we can't work with JVs, we, that's not how we work. And I, I think that that's so important as well, Alfie, because you're not getting tire kickers and, and, and I know, there are a lot of people who do want to get involved in projects like the ones that you're doing, but unfortunately just aren't quite the right fit. And actually nurturing investors and having those conversations all takes time, doesn't it? And f having a filter mechanism as well is really, really important. Um, I think it's really great to hear you talk about how clear you are about using debt and, and not JVing. Yeah. And, and, and I, I kind of make the point as well to them, like, look, I've got aspirations to do larger projects. And in those cases where we need 500 to a million pound, um, from an investor, ideally one individual, um, that's when I'm JV all day long. Like you bring the money, we do all the work. We build 50 flats, apartments, um, and happy days. That, that, at that level, I feel like it's worth my time to JV. I'm not about to JV on a on a HMO deal. Mm -hmm. Cash flow, yeah, in my case, they are quite high, a thousand five to two thousand pounds. But even still, like to, to then split that. It's like it's not. I'd rather not do the deal and the risk element, all the to count, like just mm -hmm. all the element around JV and holding long term. It's for a thousand pound a month. 
I'm sorry, it's not for me. <laughs> I don't know for some people they would do that all day long, but just in my in my circumstance and my vision and what, what I want to do, it, it's just for me, it's, it's actually a risk. It, it's just more headache. I don't need that, um, and I, I know it can be done without it. So why why if you have the option, and in my case, I do. Um, I don't have to do it basically. Mm-hmm. I've got another question I want to ask you, Alfie. I've got loads of questions I want to ask you. Um, <laughs> YouTube and the social stuff then, your videos are, you know, the same quality as your properties, this kind of A-game stuff. And I assume that that isn't stuff that, you know, you just kind of knock up quickly. It takes time. You've got to plan, prepare. You've got to edit. You've got to get the properties ready. You've got to think about scripts and stuff like that. How much time in your business do you prioritize to this social and it's marketing isn't it but it's, it's marketing yes. it's social media it's um uh brand awareness how much time of yours and your businesses do you commit to this because i think that this is something that a lot of people see and they think you know you must have just tons and tons of help or loads and loads of money just to outsource it all or just happen to have more free time than anybody else so you know, what's going on behind the scenes here with this yeah no i think social media i can i can, <laughs> I can say it's part of my life now uh, it's very normal. Uh, it's just literally like, it's my day to day. In terms of like the video creations and stuff, so I have video graphics that I work with. So I invest a lot of money into this, into this like uh, yeah. getting videos made on my YouTube videos. I, mm-hmm. I don't, yeah, I don't edit my videos. I don't mm-hmm. do the shoots myself. Um, I get people that I know in my network to come out um, and shoot. Script wise, you'd be surprised. All of it is off top. I don't. I have never written like. A yeah. script to say, oh, I'm going to say these things. <laughs> Remember, I might have bullet points on on the educational ones. I would even have bullet points, um, and yeah. and yeah, just kind of just say, oh, I want to talk about yeah. this, I want to talk about that, I want to talk about that. But sometimes like, I'm even on the shoot day, I'm, I'm I'm thinking, okay, I can say this, I can say that, like I'm planning it. So I have the topic yeah. in mind. Don't really know what exactly I'm going to say, but I'll just sit there quickly on my phone on my notes and say, I want to talk about this, talk about that, and then just go with it. Um, so yeah, script wise, I don't even the, the house tour. I, I get so mad at the end. I'm like, oh, I forgot this. I forgot that. I didn't say this. I didn't say that. Because um, a lot, a lot, a lot goes into it. And it's, yeah, but I, I never script it. I just turn up and just say, yeah, today, let's just, let's go with it. Let's see what comes out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, you know, you, you reinvest in it, don't you? You spend money on people to help you do this sort of stuff. And I think that, that shows just how much you prioritize this. I think a lot of people in business you know often make make a bit of money get the first few properties going or whatever it is and then forget to put a solution in place to keep the wheels in motion and that's reinvestment and um whether it's social media it's investing the time to do it consistently whether it's video production it's you know getting people to come and actually film the stuff so it's really interesting to hear you talk about how that sits as a priority and that that is somewhere that you reinvest funds in as well. And it's working, is it, Alpha, for you? The YouTube channel, are you starting to, to yield results from it? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say as well, just a, it's, a, it's an expense. So it's a business expense, guys. So this is, this is, this is free. Mm-hmm. Rather than pay the tax man, I'd rather chuck all that money into marketing my business and say that's, that's a business expense. So for me, it's all day long. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's a way to be tax efficient, basically, as well. So don't forget that it's not it's not money down the drain and obviously in my case it's definitely not in the sense i've had investment come through people watching my youtube um how i handle things again i show good and bad things i showed when i nearly lost a deal and had to raise money on the week of completion and people people actually feel like this guy is a problem solver does whatever he takes so this, this stuff sells and it, it, it just helps me or i guess generates leads leads for me to be able to then try and get in front of them and 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 hopefully do business with and and for me so Social media, I just, literally, like I said, I can't just think of COVID and the situation we've just been in where everybody's been indoors. The only way they could know who Alfred was was through social media. If if, if all I had was being people in, in front of, like, being in front of people and speaking to them, I would have done no deals, I would have raised no money. It was just, it would have basically impossible. I would, I would have had 18 months of, of nothing, if you know what I mean. So, mm-hmm. Was there any part of you that doubted whether... It may all work. I mean, it was sort of what it was COVID that kind of give you the push to move into property full time and where you really switch things on. Was there was there ever a point where you were unsure or didn't have the confidence that 
all of this and all the effort and time and money that you were going to invest in social media and um, brand awareness and, and personal brand might not work? Or did you always know that this was the solution and this was going to work? Um, I'm, a, I'm a big, I'm a, I have such a huge self-belief system. Like it's, if I think something's possible, you're, you're going to, I think it's literally impossible to, to tell me otherwise, basically. <laughs> so in my mind, before going into the YouTube scene, I'd seen like what I thought achieving through YouTube. And I thought if they could do it and they've had success from it, what makes it different to me? I've got to apply the same thing they've done that's worked well mm-hmm. for them and literally implement that myself. So for me, it, it wasn't a, a, a doubt in my mind that, oh, I'm, it's not going to work. Or again, I feel like the minute you have those doubts, um, you're, you're just set up to fail. So I'm not, I'm not one to kind of second guess myself. It's, I'm, once I'm in, literally, like I said, once I'm, I've sold it to myself, there's, there's nobody else that can change my mind. I'm a very stubborn person when it comes to that kind of self-belief. You can't tell me I'm the one going to put in the work, the hours to make it happen. So don't inflict your opinion on where you think something's possible or not. Um, and I'm just that kind of person. I'll find a way. I'll speak to the right people, and it's all about network. I think everything I've done in life has come from my network. I speak to the right people. I find the best in the industry. If I have to pay them again, paying someone for their time, a fee, mentoring, whatever it is, I'm a big believer. Like I've I've, I've paid for stuff and made ten times more than I paid for it. So it's like as long as I see the value, I don't care what the bill is. I'm paying that bill. And I'm getting the knowledge and going to make ten x that number. It's as simple as that. So it's a tool. Money is a tool. Make use of it. Level yourself up. Get better, and and get yeah, get moving. Yeah, I think I've had the pleasure of talking to a lot of people, a lot of people on the podcast, and a lot of people in business over the last ten, fifteen years. And self confidence, self belief, is one of the things that I think really stands out um, between those people who've been really, really successful with their businesses and, and those who have struggled more very clear where you sit Alfie and um, it's difficult not to um, kind of get get excited by that as well as just someone listening to you talk you know it's motivational it's encouraging and that's great and I think that's one of the really inspiring things about um, about you and watching your stuff and what you're doing in the game uh, and also mixed with the honesty of the stuff that doesn't go quite so well which um, you shared in the case study there were a couple of things weren't there there were I think there was an occasion when you're about to buy this property when the finance and the private finance fell through the last minute, which must have been really, really tough to to deal with. How did you deal with it? Obviously, you right. did deal with it in the end, but how did you deal with it? It was like the most, I don't even know, like, I think one of my friends, I think I messaged my friend, I think he, read, he said, I think I always say having the right for around you as well can just help keep your energy levels high. He was like, if anybody can, if anybody can do it, Alfie can do it. I, that just, that just said, yep, let's get it, let's go, let's go make this happen. Uh, but it's still nervous at the same time because you like, don't really know. Like this is, and this is not like little money. This is trying to raise a hundred or hundred odd grand mm-hmm. um, in a week. And I just literally, there was no fear, there was no shyness. And I think again, until you're in certain scenarios, you don't take that leap of faith and just, just go with it and run with it. Um, but I literally, I just messaged everybody I could think of. Uh, whether you had money, don't have money, I don't care who it was. I just said, look, I had an issue here. I'm looking to raise some more funds. I've got complete on Friday. Um, I can look to repay. I've got refinance coming in soon. And two, two, one, one close friend of mine, again, he's a property investor. He had money sat in this account and he wasn't going to use it. So he, he, he bailed me out. He helped me out. And another guy who actually asked him, does he know somebody else? He turned around and said, I'm going to back you and, and give you the money. And, and get you over the line with this one. I know, I know you're a good guy. I know you're working hard for this. So I'll back you. And again, I, I was, I'd, I've never have guessed this guy had the level of money. So he gave me 50 grand as well. And, and it helped me get, get over. So it's just, I don't know where, I don't know where it was going to come from. I just put myself out there and it just by chance happened. Literally by chance. I can't, I don't know. I can't take any credit for it to be honest. <laughs> you're obviously someone who can work well under pressure as well, Alfred. So your case study, I'm really excited to talk about it. So at Coventry, 265000 was the purchase price. And I've got some pictures of it. And for everyone listening, Alfie's case study is inside the HMO roadmap. You can look at it, all of the details, the backstory, uh, and all of the incredible before and after pictures. Uh, and of course, all of the juicy numbers. But just headline is 265000 purchase price. And the refurb cost, we already said, was over one hundred. It was 120000 quid. And you were all in for just just south of 400,000. So this is a big project. 
and the reval was half a mil. So this is a big project for HMO in Coventry. Um, how many bedrooms was it, Alfie? This is a seven-bedroom HMO. Uh, I had two, uh, three um, pseudo-type pseudo rooms and four double and suite rooms. Um, and then rent-wise, it was achieved anywhere between 550 um, and 700 um, for the studio rooms. And is that you pushing the market with those rents? Not re no, I think studio rooms. Studio rooms are going for that. Well, I guess actually no, tell totally like Six fifty. So I've seen studio rooms anywhere between six fifty to seven two five. Um, is where I'd say the, the top top end is. Um, and I, I think the, the the bigger the room, the and yeah, the more you can kind of push the, the seven two five mark. And the I'll say double and suit rooms. Yeah, that's that's top and end of the market. I think that's around anywhere between five hundred to five fifty. Um, but again, I've achieved some of them. I've achieved five seven five. It just depends on the size of the room you're providing, and the property how nice it is, and someone's willing to pay for that. So it's, that's that's the honest. Yeah. Uh, so that one, yeah, definitely on the top end of the market for sure. And this particular project nets over two thousand pound a month, doesn't it? So it's a really really well performing property. And actually, for I think if you look at the average salary in the UK, this is pretty this is pretty much there, isn't it? And um, you know, certainly wouldn't take 40 hours a week to run. So th this is a really, really powerful project. And um, I think another uh, metric I want to highlight here is the return on the capital employed. So big project, big numbers, and you managed to recycle 50% of the capital, which was, is obviously key to your strategy. Um, is that capital that you use to pay investors back or is that capital that you're able to hold on to and recycle forwards into the next project? Yeah, literally, I've got to a point where I am now, I want to make the money work as hard as possible. Um, and this is another reason why when people talk about, oh, I'll be telling about the deal. I'm like, I could tell you about the deal, but if you're burning money to me over a 12-month period, the chances are that money would have gone through at least two, three deals in that time frame. So it's kind of irrelevant how this deal performs. Rather, it's you burning money to me and me making the money work as hard as possible. You're getting a fixed return on your money um, and not necessarily around the deal. Because whether the deal performs or doesn't perform, like, for instance, if the deal doesn't perform, can I come back to you and say your return is X amount because it didn't perform? The answer is no. So in, in essence, you have to kind of trust that I know what I'm doing. Um, I'm someone capable of delivering. And if something goes wrong, I'm still someone's going to be able to pay you back your funds. And, and, and that's where I see it. So, yeah, all the funds I get with my refinance literally goes into my next project and into the next. I'm trying to get it literally pinpoint. If refinance money comes in, <laughs> money's gone back out in a couple of weeks. So I'm never sat on money because I need that money working hard. Uh, to be able to repay my investors and, and get assets which then produce income as well. Another thing is well, people don't realize when you're scaling, you, there is a level you want to keep every every property you add to the portfolio is bringing a certain amount of income. Very soon, that income could get to 20 grand, 30 grand a month. That's good chunks of money. So in my case, where I'm leaving 50 grand in a deal, for example, in this particular deal, yes, 50, 50, in my, from my point of view, 50 grand is not as big of a money. Um, in the sense, the, the money that I'm, I'm ha I have around me in terms of investing, um, it's, it's not a huge sum, and plus my cash flow as well. So every single penny I, I make is reinvested. I don't I don't necessarily live off that money just yet. I don't need to. Um, literally all the money going back in, if it's to secure new projects, planning gain, do you know I mean? putting deposits down on some of the planning gain, I'm putting that money back in and making the money work hard as possible. Um, so literally everything is left within the business and yeah, later on I can, yeah, if I want to pull some money out, I can, um, but for now I've got so much projects going on. I want to just utilize it where best. Sounds like to me, Alfred, you've got a really long term view on what you're doing here, which I, I think is quite unique. A lot of people, I think, want to get into property, want to get into HMOs because the cash flow quite well and they hope to make that work quite quickly. and. And in some cases that's possible, but in most cases it, you know, it is a business that takes time to mature. It, there are easier businesses to set up and run, and I've said this before, than, than HMO businesses. It's a lot of capital, it's a lot of work. You've got to manage the whole process. You've got to manage it at the back end or have it managed. It's not an easy business model to master. And again, I think the people have really achieved great success in it are those who's, who've had a long-term view on it. They've reinvested funds, they've been really clever about how they've used the funds that they do have and that that certainly sounds like you but i think you mentioned you gave us kind of a, a bit of a snippet earlier but what's in the pipeline what can we expect from alfred in the future 
Um, so, uh, like I said, I, I kind of I've got a shift from HMOs, like fully like double and suite rooms, to kind of I want to have some studio properties within my my portfolio as well. Um, so I've got three um, currently in planning: uh, eight eight studios, seven studios, and another seven studios going through planning. I'm a bit nervous about them to be honest because um, there's there's another property that got recently rejected. It was, but it's, okay. it's an eight bedroom HMO, it had six studios. It's only get eight studios, but they're trying to be clever with the scheme where two of the rooms they had taken out um, the kitchens out of the rooms, um, just to kind of class as HMO, um, as like a shared, 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 shared space, basically. And uh, maybe that's what my triggered. I, I read, I read, I read the local plan, read the, the, the feedback of the local planner. So I'm literally having a meeting with my architect after this call to revise our drawings. Our statements just to make sure I, I want to get this plan and I'm going to write a case to so this, this case officer to kind of get him to know me, what kind of products I'm putting out there in Coventry to kind of just kind of sway him a bit as well. Um, there's no harm in doing so. Um, but that's what I think I've got in the pipeline. I, I potentially have another opportunity to maybe do a nine, a nine studio property or maybe a flat conversion with that one because it's big, it's got a huge land in the back as well. Uh, but I haven't secured that just yet. I'm just waiting to kind of get feedback from the agent. Um, and I'm looking at some large um, development deals as well um, in the power player in the background as well. But that's like early, early days. But it's exciting, 50 units plus. Um, so I'm excited about that one the most. <laughs> it certainly does all sound very, very exciting. And I've got no doubt at all that you're going to crack on, smash all of these goals and targets that you set yourself and continue to put bigger and bigger goals in place. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing just how far you can take all of this, Alfred. It's been a real pleasure having you on the show. A really interesting conversation. There's so many different tangents that we could go down and I'm sure we could continue to talk for hours about different things. And you know what? I think you've dropped some absolute bombs today, Alfie, you know, on all sorts of different things. And I think there's, I found a huge number of similarities between the way that we approach deals as well, which is always interesting to to talk about. But um, for yeah, everyone listening, where's the best place to, to find find you and connect? Um, definitely, definitely Instagram. Uh, if you follow me on Instagram, you kind of see day to day of how I get things done and how the struggles I go through sometimes. <laughs> um, but I think Instagram is the easiest place, but I also have a YouTube channel where I showcase my projects from start to finish as well. And I share some educational videos from here from time to time as well on there. So I think the two main ones are my Instagram. So it's Alfred Jade, so D Z A D E Y, um, and both on Instagram and YouTube. So yeah, find me on there, connect. Uh, Alfred, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you, have you on the show. Really, really enjoyable. So thank you so much for coming and talking HMOs with us today.